Welcome to the weekly sermon podcast for the Wilmington, Ohio Church of Christ. We pray that this message will inspire you and help you grow closer to God in your faith. Be sure to stick around after the message to find out more about how you can take your next best step. Enjoy the message. Her eyes were this big around. When she came back into the room, I'd only ever seen eyes one time before like that. I'm kicking my, I've been kicking myself for 20 years that we didn't buy the picture of when my son rode his first roller coaster. He was in first grade and we took him on Space Mountain. He was there with his girlfriend and their family were there and the picture flashed at just the right opportunity and I'm telling you his eyes were just like this. That was exactly how the look on the face of one of our disciples was, one of the members of this church, when she came back into the room when we started our discipleship course. Her eyes were this big around when she came back in, and she never came back. We had started a discipleship course, and it was our first class, and the material had us exit the room and do one-on-one confessions with people we just met. And this church member was not ready, and we were not ready, to exchange confessions of sin in that moment. They called it accountability groups, but really it was confession time. We want to be a church that's not surprised by sin. We want to be a church that's upset by sin, that's saddened by sin, but moves with compassion when we encounter people stuck in sin. And we want to teach them how to overcome and walk in freedom, but not be surprised. Every person in this room can experience forgiveness and the ability to walk in freedom from sin and the emotional wounds it causes by learning how to do the two forms of confession God gives us. One, we need to confess our sins, and two, we need to confess our Savior. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Lord, we ask now that as we start today's lesson from Scripture, that you would open up our eyes, not in surprise, but in understanding, so that we can latch hold of more firmly, the truth of the forgiveness you offer. That we would have understanding in such a way that we can have our eyes open to see where people are hurting and we can move into their lives through the power of the Holy Spirit within us and even teach them how to be forgiven in Christ so they can spread it to someone else. Lord, we ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit that is here in our presence, that is within dwelling those of us in Christ, we ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to take the Scripture today and not allow it to go out and come back empty, but to accomplish your will, bringing about a transformation in our own character to look and act and sound and be like the character of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I imagine this was the same eyes King David had when Nathaniel the prophet came to him and said, King David, I've got to tell a terrible story. There is a rich landowner that owns lots of cattle and lots of sheep, and he lives next to a very poor landowner who only owns one lamb. And that poor family raised that lamb up as one of their own family members, a pet. And when that rich landowner had visitors, he went and stole that lamb and killed it to feed his visitors. King David probably had a look of surprise and anger when he says, that rich landowner must be punished. And the prophet said, King David, it's you. See, if you don't know the story of King David, he saw one of his best friend's wives bathing. And because he was king, he could take her. And after committing adultery and getting her pregnant, he had one of his friends killed, murdered. And then he covered it over with lies. 
and God knew. And when David was accused, he realized all the guilt and shame that he had been feeling, that had been pressing down on him, needed to be resolved. He wrote us a teaching poem about it in Psalm 32. See, if you're dealing with unresolved guilt and unresolved shame, we need to figure out what to do about it. In Psalm 32, David teaches us David was forgiven for that multitude of sin, but his ministry and his kingdom was never the same. But he himself was able to find peace and walk in freedom afterwards. Here's a poem he wrote to us that helps us understand what we should do if we are caught in sin, if we know that we have rebellion against God, if we know that we are sinners. Here's what he says. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose iniquity the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. David described four words that described his own heart of sin in that first two lines. Transgression, we learned last week, means rebellion against God's ways. Sin means we miss God's mark. Iniquity means we twist and pervert what God says is good and for our enjoyment. And then he covers it over with deceit and hides his sin from others. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose iniquity, Yahweh, does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not surround them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by a bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but Yahweh's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This psalm, this teaching poem, teaches us what to do If we're walking in sin, it teaches us how to confess our sin, turn to God, be forgiven, and how to confess our Savior with rejoicing and joy. First, we need to know why we need to confess sin. Psychologist Dr. Guy Winch, I don't know who that is, but he's got a doctorate degree. He says the average American experiences up to five hours of guilt every day. Our minds kind of go to dark places. That's why a lot of us have white noise or music or the TV on all the time. We don't like to be alone with our thoughts. What does five hours of guilt and shame going through our mind turn into? Well, it makes us not be able to concentrate as well, Dr. Winch says. It makes us lose sleep. It builds bitterness and resentment in our lives. We avoid the people we think we have offended, and that begins to turn into depression or can turn into depression and anxiety, which leads to a host of physical ailments, all because of unresolved guilt. Dr. Winch is not a believer as far as I know, but he says one of the ways that you can help counteract and resolve guilt is to offer true, sincere, real apologies. I think that's great advice. David, writing a thousand years before Jesus, noticed these physical ailments that were going on with him in his guilt when he was dealing with unresolved guilt, unresolved shame, and was unforgiven in his life, he says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Isn't it 
incredible that a thousand years before Jesus, 3,000 years ago, there was a poet who wrote about what the psychologists call today the problems of shame and guilt in our own life, unresolved guilt. Why do we need to get rid of this guilt? Why do we need to learn how to confess? Because it causes so many problems. Not only does it cause physical ailments, physical, emotional, psychological, physiological, not only does it cause actual problems in our body, but there's also a spiritual problem of unresolved guilt. Some psychologists will say today that it's just an emotion and you need to learn how to take care of the emotion. But we know from God that guilt is caused by real problems. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, and God has given us a conscience in our mind, a conscience within us that lets us know when we have crossed the boundary between good and evil. That guilt is real guilt because of real sin. And there's a danger, the Scripture always points out to us, that we can sear our conscience like with a hot iron where we stop feeling guilt for sin That's an even bigger problem than unresolved guilt. David felt this physical ailment, but he also felt something like the hand of God pressing on him. For day and night, verse 4, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. There's a spiritual problem with unresolved guilt that happens too. Not only do we maybe have a stagnation in our spiritual growth, we might even have a decline. Not only might we have a decline in spiritual growth, but God's hand might come on us. Now, this is not a hand of wrath. This is not his anger and vengefulness against sin. This is a hand of discipline from a loving father. Hebrews chapter 12 describes it this way. Our parents, if they were good parents, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We all, like little children, are heading toward the light socket to put our finger in there. Which would be better? For God, the good Father, to allow us to put our finger in the light socket and go to our death and destruction or slap our hands in discipline. We're all heading like little children to run and play in the busy street. Which would be better for God the good Father to allow us to continue headlong along that path or provide discipline that is painful at the time but keeps us from dying? David, the writer of Psalm 32, felt God's discipline on him and he was thankful Not at the time. It was painful. But later he was able to look back and say, he kept me even though he was disciplining me. See, we need to take care of our sin problem through what the Bible gives us as ways to resolve our guilt and to live in the freedom that Christ offers, to live in the forgiveness that Jesus' death and sacrifice on the cross and resurrection provides, and it's through Confession. Now, a lot of times I know confession can have all these meanings because we have different practices of Christianity that practice confession differently, but the Scripture gives us an idea of what confession would look like and why we're supposed to do it. But there's rewards for confession as well. I know I have a list of 12 different rewards that come from this idea that we would confess our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says, Our Lord is righteous and just, and if we confess our sins, He's faithful and will forgive us and cleanse us. That's a powerful promise. But there's a reward that is more than just forgiveness, more than just a cleansing of our consciousness. It goes much deeper than that when we learn how to confess our sins. There is true, genuine self-knowledge about yourself when you can finally admit that you are not perfect and that you have a problem that only someone bigger and greater than you can take care of. There's a Christian humility that grows. There is bad habits that are corrected. If you have a sin problem that you keep going back to that feels like chains around your wrists or ankles, and every time you get a little bit away from it, you come back and you fall back in sin again, a confession breaks those chains. 
Bad habits become erased. Our willpower is increased. Our uh, self-control increases. Also, when we are stuck in sin without confession, unresolved guilt and shame, we become spiritually neglectful. And we feel like we need to run away from God instead of running to Him. We have spiritual apathy. All of these are countered and healed with confession. And joy is returned. Healing occurs. Not every bit of depression and anxiety and physical ailment is caused by guilt. But there are some physical ailments that are caused by guilt. And when the guilt is resolved, the physical ailments heal. We become healed physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, and physiologically. A good apology is right. Dr. Winch is right. But a confession to God and the forgiveness and grace that Jesus is even better. It happened. This is a promise that God gives us before the church was formed. For his own people, he said in 2 Chronicles, he said, if my people, if my people, When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That was a promise to the Israelites. In the New Testament, this promise happened at the beginning of the first church when Peter was talking to the people who were coming to Jesus for the very first time in the first century. And he was teaching them about Christ. And he was saying, what you did when you killed him and how you rejected him was in ignorance. But now there's a chance for healing. Acts chapter 3. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And then after the church was established, John, one of Jesus' best friends, he says, God is faithful. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I've already mentioned it, but I'll say it again. I misquoted it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a fantastic promise that God gives us, that there is a reward of healing, that we can learn to walk in freedom if we learn how to confess our sins. Who do we confess our sins to? Ultimately, we confess our sins to God above. But sometimes, He is calling for us to be reminded of the grace that we have in Jesus Christ by confessing our sins to other brothers and sisters who are faithful believers. In James... James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't even believe Jesus was the Son of God until after he rose from the dead. James, in chapter 5, says, if any among you sick, you should have the elders come and pray over you and put oil on your head. And the Christ follower who confesses their sin will be healed. There's a confession that happens between other brothers and sisters in Christ that God calls us to sometimes. Not only as a way to get healing, but a way to have our sin removed from us so that we can walk in freedom. If you have a sin that you have gone to God about over and over and over again, and you really mean it, you really want forgiveness, and you never want to go back to it again, but you have a tendency to go back to it, and it's a repeat offense, that chain will probably only be broken if you have a trusted friend you're allowed to confess verbally to that they will remind you of the forgiveness you have in Christ and help hold you accountable so that you can begin growing again in the Lord. We need to learn how to confess our sin. And I think maybe we should practice it today. Anybody get nervous right there? I have these papers up here, and I'm going to need some help passing them out. And it's a sin test where we can practice confession. These papers have 12 questions on it that are answered yes or no. Don't put your name on this paper. It's anonymous. We're going to practice confession so we can grow in this spiritual practice. Don't look at anybody else's paper but your own. Eyes only on your paper. 
I encourage you, we're gonna, I'm going to need some help passing these out, I encourage you to answer these 12, 12 questions as honestly as you can, and then you're going to fold it up once, and you're going to fold it up again, and not let anybody else see it, but just hold on to it. Here's the rules. Please follow closely. I'm going to have help passing out these pages. There, yeah, you can come and help me. There are 12 questions. Yeah, come and help me. I have pens here as well. Papers and pens. 12 questions. Yes or no answers. Mark either yes or no. There's going to be 12 questions that appear on the screen. If you fall in that sin category, you're going to mark yes. If you don't fall in that sin category, mark no. You're going to mark an answer for each question. Yes or no. Don't look at any other paper. If you are uncomfortable filling out a paper sitting next to the person you're sitting next to, move to another location so they can't see. See, confession is scary when you don't know how to trust the Lord and you've never done it before and you don't know how to trust your brother and sister in Christ. Please raise your hand if you need a card. Now, the questions that are going to be asked for this card are going to be kind of external bad sin questions. They're going to be sins of commission, where God says, don't do this, and then we do it anyway. But it doesn't even begin to talk about the sins of omission, where God says, do this, and he's not giving us a suggestion, and then we don't do what he says. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Raise your hand if you still need a card. Raise your hand if you still need a pen. They're coming around. Thank you for helping. As soon as you get a card or a pen, you can put your hand down. We're practicing confession. It's a scary, scary situation. Do you still need a pen over here? You can come get a pen and help me pass those out. I've got a couple right here. Now, as the volunteers are helping to pass out the cards in person, online, and listening through podcast or, or listening uh, as a recording, we're going to do it a little bit differently. So we can't pass out a paper to you, but I want to give you the questions to be able to follow along at home or on the road. And as I read the questions that everybody else is answering in person, uh, again, I don't know how you're going to answer it, but as I read the questions, you just have to answer with a yes or a no. Yes, I have committed this sin, or no, I have not committed this sin. Now, these are kind of like external questions about sin. Uh, we talk about maybe like some of the bad things uh, where God says, don't do this. It's unhealthy. It'll lead down a path of destruction or a path of death. But it's not the good things that God tells us to do. For example, I'm not going to ask you the questions about when God gives us command that are not suggestions, but commands, and we don't end up doing them. Those are sins too. For example, he tells us to take care of widows and orphans. And so you have to ask yourself, did I take care of a widow or an orphan last week? Well, if the answer is no, that counts as a sin. And what we're doing with these questions, the ones of sins of commission or the ones of omission, we, we did something we're not supposed to do or we didn't do something we are supposed to do, the, the point we're trying to make, and you'll see in just a couple of minutes when we come back to the recorded feed, is that everybody has sinned. So I'm going to give you some questions. Uh, again, not the questions about doing what is right. For example, God tells us to share Jesus and give our testimony. Uh, God tells us to pray continually. Well, we all end up answering that we didn't do those correctly. Well, here are the 12 questions that we asked our church, and we asked the people in person and online, and now you get to answer in your own mind whether this is something you have done or not. Number one, have you ever lusted after something or someone that wasn't yours? Number two, do you have anything in your life that you regret? Number three, do you have anything in your life that you are constantly ashamed of? Number four, have you ever cut yourself or intentionally harmed yourself? Number five, have you ever physically, verbally, or sexually abused someone else? Number six, have you ever abused drugs or alcohol? Number seven, have you ever thought about or attempted suicide? Number eight, have you ever had a sexual relationship outside of marriage? 
Number nine, do you have any secrets that you've never shared with anyone? Number 10, are you doing anything wrong that you can't quit? Number 11, have you purposefully and willfully viewed pornography? Number 12, have you ever lied to someone in your effort to hide your actions? Well, in our congregation, in the live setting, and something you won't be able to see as you listen, but you'll be able to hear, I ask everyone who answered yes to one of those questions, especially those that are pretty clearly sinful, I ask if I I had them switch their papers, which you might hear, and then they received an anonymous paper of someone else, but they didn't know who, and then I asked if there is a single yes on that page, would you please stand up? And you'll be able to hear it in the audio, but we shouldn't be shocked by this. Every single person in our congregation who participated in this quiz stood up. We had a room full of sinners. And it just shows that everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody sins. And so we don't really, we're not in a position where we're able to cast judgment on somebody else for their sin. We're not in a position to look down on other people because they have made mistakes or they're messing up. But what it does do for us is it reveals that because we've been given forgiveness, we need to extend that same forgiveness to others. Because we've been given grace, we need to extend that grace to others. Because we have been forgiven, received grace and mercy, we need to not be shocked and run away from people who are hurting and in sin. We need to have compassion and move toward them and offer the same grace, forgiveness and mercy that we have been given. Now we're gonna go back to the Uh, recorded version, and you'll pick up right as soon as our congregation stands up. And if you have a yes for any of those questions that we went through, would you please stand if you're able at this time? I guess we know where sinners go. Wilmington Church of Christ. See, have you ever thought that the people that came here were perfect? We're not. Every single person in here has sinned and needs the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. If you ever felt like you have sinned in such a way that you wouldn't be welcome here, Just look around you because you are surrounded by sinners who have been forgiven. If you've ever thought that your sin is too big for Jesus Christ, look around. There is no one here that will judge you because the people that are standing are the worst sinners we know. If you ever felt like this wasn't a safe place, just look around. Everybody in here is messed up. Everybody in here has rebelled. Everybody in here has fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody in here has twisted something good God has given us. There is no sin that Jesus can't give you freedom for if you're trusting in his ways. One of the things he says we can do to find freedom is learn to confess. We should be able to move into confession. This was just a practice. Everybody in here got to confess somebody else's sin and nobody got kicked out. What do you think will happen if you confess your own sin? We have to confess our sin and then we move to confess our Savior. Would you be seated, please? The scripture says, that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15 says, if you acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be forgiven and cleansed. And Jesus gives us a warning. 
He says, if you confess me before other people, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before other people, I will deny you before the Father. But if we turn to Jesus Christ, we don't need to run from Him. We need to run to Him. There's nothing you have done that His sacrifice on the cross will not cover over. There is no sin great enough. Jesus says, run to Him. His grace, His grace is greater than our guilt. His grace is greater than our sin. We need to tell other people about that. Jesus did give us a couple of ways to publicly confess as a church continually. One of those ways is baptism. When we confess that Jesus is our Lord, we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, we're told and instructed in Scripture to be baptized. And that's a public confession that we are united with Jesus' death and burial and raised by faith to a new life. It's a public confession of faith. Peter says the baptism, this baptism now saves you, not with a washing like with soap and water, but with a cleansing of your conscience. And there's another public confession that he gives us as a church. It's through communion. When we participate in communion, we are confessing to everyone around us that we accept the forgiveness Jesus Christ gives us and we declare His death and resurrection until He comes again, all through the bread and the cup. Would you take out your bread? As you remember this bread, Jesus says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you remember that on the cross, he took into his body your sin and my sin and the sin of everybody that stood up around you and he put it to death on the cross. Would you remember that and participate in the bread? Jesus Christ, we praise you because you have taken our sin. You have paid our debt. You became a curse in our place. You absorbed the wrath of God instead of us. Thank you for that sacrifice. Would you take out the cup? Would you remember the words of Christ that he said, this is the covenant of of blood, in His blood, a new covenant, where we're not only forgiven, where we're not only washed clean, but we're also joined to the family of God as a child of God because of the blood of Christ. Would you participate in the cup? Jesus, we praise you and thank you. For your blood that covers over our sin. David came to his senses. He said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgive the guilt of my sin. It's almost as soon as he said it, he was forgiven. Then he commands us, he gives us instructions Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Go to confession now to the Lord, and he will forgive you. Then he said, I got to tell other people. That's our witness. That's our testimony. You get to tell people how God has given you freedom, and you get to walk in freedom. He said, I will instruct and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you, not in destruction, not in anger, but in love do we call people to repentance and confession. And then he talks about me. Do not be stubborn like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Does that describe anybody else in here? Where God says, 
confess your sins and you stubbornly go the other way, this is me. Don't be stubborn. The hardest thing I've ever done in my Christian life is go to another brother in Christ that I trusted and confess my sins. And it's been the most rewarding. Don't have to be led there. Don't stubbornly reject this offer of grace and peace that will allow you to walk in a freedom. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Confession is just another proving point that you entrust yourself to Jesus Christ, his forgiveness and his ways. If you need to find somebody to confess to, any of our elders or small group leaders, Sunday school teachers or staff, I feel like would not look at you with shocked eyes if you said you would like to confess a sin. But you don't need paid, set apart staff members or set apart elders. There are brothers and sisters in Christ in this room that you saw stand up because everybody in here has sinned. I do recommend, if you want to go confess to a brother or sister, that you find somebody that's mature, that you trust, that will be discreet, that will be honest with you, that will ask questions about you and the sin you've committed so they can respond with wisdom. And if you receive a confession, you need to be discreet and honest. You need to ask them questions and you need to pray. You need to ask God to give you wisdom on what response you need to give your friend, your brother in Christ, your sister in Christ. Because it might need that you need wisdom to say, you need to go tell somebody else and apologize. You need to go make this right. Or it could be the only thing you need to tell them is remember the sacrifice Jesus made for you on the cross. His grace is greater than anything you've done to be guilty. We hope you have enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, talk to, or maybe you just want more information about our church, be sure to fill out a connect card so we can reach out and help you take your next best step. Thanks again for joining, and we will see you back here next time.